Hey guys, this is John. Okay, I think we're good to go. Sorry, I'm starting this a move and a half late. This is a standard game on leechess.org, 15 plus two time control. My screen capture was getting a little messed up, so I wasn't able to do my introduction before move one. So I'm playing a 2120 in rapid on lead chess, ABC 1230. I like my position already. This is an opening D4, D6, C4, E5 that I've played before on this channel, sometimes called the rat. And if we get an early exchange of queens, we're gonna go into an end game that I think black is already fine in. There's a lot of play, but even though black has lost castling rights, I can play C6, King C7, my light square bishop will often have a good home on e6. We're playing a queenless middle game here. All right, and I'm recording this specifically for YouTube, so no streaming at the moment. You won't see any, uh, hey guys, this is John, pop-ups or anything like that. And good to be back recording some proper standard because it has been a while, and I know you guys like these videos, so thanks for the feedback. All right, so yeah, as I said, I've played this before. I have a pretty good score in this line. Uh, watch out for the potential weakness of the d4 square, especially if white commits to e4 at some point. I'm gonna play c6 here, just guard d5 and b5. But often, if white puts the pawn there to try to put another pawn in the center, maybe strengthen their control over d5, that d4 square will be a prime outpost in the future. Okay, knight f3, white develops and attacks the pawn on e5. Let's play f6. And admittedly, it looks a little strange that black can get away with so many pawn moves and also have their king on d8. White may end up castling queenside soon with check. But the solidity of black's structure and the fact that I'm covering all the available inroads, especially for white's knights, is extremely important here. And that's the main reason white's going to struggle to get much in the short term. So e3, okay. Yeah, I think this is a wise structure that white is adopting here. Refraining from putting the pawn on e4. Let's play bishop e6, I think. I'm also debating if I want to retain the bishop's option to go to f5. No, let's just put it on e6 for now. Maybe I can get white to play b3. And that creates some potential weaknesses on the dark squares, specifically squares like b4 and a3. Okay, bishop e2. So maybe white's going to castle short. We shall see. Now, these knights often get developed in interesting fashion. So like knight h6, knight f7 is not at all unusual for this line. Uh, knight a6, if I want to try to poke into b4 or c5. Don't feel a pressing need to play king c7 here. So I'm leaning towards uh, knight h6 in this position. And just continuing from there, I think I will. This is an increment game, but not a huge increment. Two seconds. Time management is always at a premium. So I think for the next five-ish moves, both of us are going to be simply bringing our pieces into the game. Okay, uh, maybe now king c7 since rook d1 could be coming. Only thing about king c7 is if white eventually plays bishop b2 and then tries to put a rook on c1, I may have to watch out for some knight d5 ideas. But that's a ways off, so I will play this now. Possibly by keeping my knight on h6 for the time being, I can provoke white into playing this e4 move if they want to hit my knight. Again, I wouldn't mind seeing that at all because I want that d4 square. Also, I do keep the option of knight f5. A little bit more of an active placement for the knight. And even though the kings are on opposite wings here, I don't think a pawn storm for either side is going to be a dominant plan. Maybe if I bring my pieces into the game, I get the knight back to f7. I will consider plans like g5, h5, but I would say it's more so going to be done for general space space gaining purposes 
rather than an outright attack against the enemy king. Okay, white does play rook d1. Thinking about bringing this piece into the game. Do I want to go through a6 or d7? a6 looks a little more pesky for white. I might prefer that ever so slightly. Yeah, let's do that. Make white think about knight b4. If a3, knight c5 gains in some strength, I can try to get into the b3 square. Maybe grab the bishop pair. White does play a3. Okay. Now, if I had my knight on d7, I would probably react to this move with a5. But because I have played knight a6 blocking the a pawn, I'm going to go knight c5. And we'll see if white commits to b4. b4, knight b3, rook b1, knight takes c1, let's say. Uh, knight takes c1. And yeah, I'll decide from there what to do. Maybe rook d8 at that point. Again, I will have to watch the knight d5 idea if white ends up with a rook here opposite my king. Okay, and white does play b4. So let's go ahead and do this. Maybe white's not upset about losing the dark square bishop for the knight, given that this bishop was a bit blocked in by their own pawns. So... Yeah, don't know if they're going to lose sleep over that. If white for some reason plays rook a2 here, I might play a5. But yeah, white just plays rook, C, rook b1. All right. Now, in view of this idea, I do think that rook d8 move I mentioned is pretty decent. Because I want to be able to meet knight d5 with king back to b8, in fact. Just thinking if there's any tactical reason uh, to be wary here. Oh, maybe there is knight b5. I actually didn't appreciate this. Knight b5. Okay. Interesting. So if rook d8, knight b5 check, then if pawn takes, pawn takes with a discover check here, King b8, I would lose after rook takes d8. So, all right, I got to exercise some caution at this point. Maybe my uh, quick trade of the bishop, uh, of the light square, of the dark square bishop for my knight was not in my best interest. Hmm. Okay, so in that case, how best to coordinate here? Because tactically speaking, I really only have to negotiate these jumps for now. Maybe I can even pull my bishop back, although that does block the square for the knight that I might want to go to. Then again, knight f5 is, is always possible. If I play bishop f7 and white goes knight b5, we get a trade. I think I can play king b6. a4, bishop takes b4. My bishop covers the d6 square. It's not super comfortable, that's for sure, but <laughs> I think it's all right. Hmm. Could also think about playing rook e8. Looks a little odd, though. Might be fine. Okay, so rook e8 or bishop f7. Main moves I'm thinking about at the moment. Yeah, otherwise knight d5 is going to be a bother. Maybe I can allow knight d5 and play king b8, but I just not not liking my king position there. Hmm. I wonder if white's going to play for c5, whether I go rook e8 or bishop f7. Some plan like that does come to mind. Knight d2, knight in here. I could see that being played. I'm leaning towards rook e8 now. Rook e8, knight d5, and then just king b8. Yeah, let's play that. I've thought about this move enough. 
So a slight wrench in the works in that I couldn't play the, the natural move that I wanted to play, rook d8. But we're adapting. We're trying to roll with it. I paused. And let's see what white plays. Long term, I still like the bishop pair. Even though the position remains relatively closed. I'm not drinking both coffee and tea, by the way. This is actually water in here. Those of you who watch my stream will know that I often just fill up the coffee cup with water. Often when there's a little bit of coffee left, I'll like dump the water in and try to extract all the caffeine possible. Many of you consider that to be disgusting, but I just think that's efficient. You know, I'm a hardworking guy. I'm uh, looking to create content for you guys all the time, so I need my, my caffeine intake. <laughs> but I got the coffee water and the herbal tea going at the moment. So c5, knight d2, bishop c4 is a pretty typical operation for this type of structure, I would say. And I, I would do that if I were white, just as a default plan. Maybe on this move I can throw in bishop b3. Okay, white plays rook here. Hmm. So that makes me happy because that blocks the knight. So we got that going for us. I guess white's idea is to double up. but how much do we really care? All right, so knight f7 or knight f5 or bishop e7 even. Bishop e7, there's still knight d5. So I should probably wait to play a move like that until at least there's not a c-file situation going on. I also kind of like the look of this c5, uh, a5 move rather, but... White's probably going to react with c5 as soon as I play that. Hmm. Let's go knight f7. Still on knight d5. I'm playing king b8 and just chilling. What will I do if white plays rook c to d1? And the reason I'm not afraid of rook c to d1 is there's no infiltration point for the rooks. I've got d8, d7, and d6 very well guarded. So no worries there. I'll probably just play bishop e7. Complete my development. Okay, my opponent's burning some time. Rook d2 feels like one of those moves that in the moment looks logical, but you come to regret it pretty quickly. You realize there's not much of a plan associated with that. But maybe white will surprise me. Wouldn't be the first time. So it's just good in a situation like this while your opponent's thinking and the position's relatively calm to have an idea of what you're going to do over the next few moves. And as I said, for me, I think bishop e7, maybe rook d8, and an eventual a5. That's what I'd like to do. Okay, knight e1. Hmm. Where is that knight going? I guess. Is it really going to d3 even? Because that pawn looks loose if white does. I don't know. I could play knight d6, but again, c5, jump in here. I might get both bishops. But I think I feel better about the position, just completing my development in the short term. So yeah, let's go, go ahead and play bishop e7. Connect the rooks. Oh, did I allow knight d5? White did not play rook c1, so I just allowed knight d5. 
Hmm. Okay. Well, knight d5, I can still play king b8, but white can take e7. So, yeah, that was probably a misstep on my part. Yeah, a little sloppy. Yep. Okay, let's play king b8 and act like we saw that. <laughs> Trade. There goes my bishop pair. All right, well... The one thing I was looking forward to using in the position is now gone. But the position remains rich. So I think anything can happen here. All right, so white does double at this point. e4, knight e5, maybe? It's an interesting little plan. Try to cramp my position slowly. I like the look of it. Again, I'm guarding all these squares, so... That shouldn't be too much of an issue. Could also play the king back to c7 and maybe go for this a5 operation I was mentioning. Uh, but I'm kind of liking this e4 idea. a5 maybe loses some value when I don't have the dark square bishop. Yeah, probably does. If e4, I do give up the d4 square. That is a downside. So, like, knight c2 to d4 is probably a natural plan for my opponent. Just thinking if the counterattack I get against their queen side is worth it. So, like, e4, knight c2, knight e5, uh, c5, knight b3, or bishop b3, maybe. It's also a check on the back rank, though. Hmm. I'm just going to play king c7. Not sure if I'm ready to commit to e4 yet. Maybe we'll defer to this idea. Keep our options open otherwise. Yeah, my thought process has been erratic this game. But the position is still plenty playable. I just started watching Queen's Gambit on Netflix, by the way. I know many of you have been asking about it. And uh, I've only seen an episode and a half, but I really like it so far. Okay, F3. Hmm. White kind of digging in here. I like the look of A5 still. A5, maybe white goes for B5. But then that side of the board starts to get a little loose for my opponent, so... Yeah, let's go ahead and stab with the a5. I think knight c2 is a, a likely possibility here. And then I can take and play rook a8, look to activate the rook. Maybe rook a1, if we're forecasting kind of deep here. Take, take. Knight d6, because white's rooks are not stacked anymore. Uh, c5, and I can try to work my, my knight in somewhere like c4 or maybe f5. Well, I could play b5 too, but the thing about b5 is I may have a way to sneak in with my king later on. So maybe some sort of king b6, king c5. Okay, so white does play this. Now, should I get a pair of rooks off the board? If rook d8, I do have to watch some b6 ideas. Speaking of tactics to be aware of. I could play rook d7 if I want to swap, although I'd prefer to keep my bishop on e6. Could just take here. Park my king on b6, but that feels less desirable. Even on rook d7, there's tick take b6 ideas. Hmm. What to do? e4, pawn sacrifice? Eh, well, I could even ignore it if they needed to. Maybe I run the king up right away. Another thing that comes to mind.
Hmm. I'm thinking I might just want to swap on b5 and play king b6. I'm kind of fingers crossed that my king is a little bit more active in the endgame. I think I'm going to do that. Feels like somewhat of a concession, but yeah, let's go ahead and play this. Rook c8 or rook c7. We now have an open c file up for grabs. If rook d6, I take. So no worries there. I still think this knight is a problem piece for white. But my knight also is not the most active at the moment. It's controlling some nice squares. But yeah, I think white has to look to solve this guy. My opponent's been doing well to create tactical problems for me, like subtle tactical problems, one of which I blanked on earlier, the knight d5 move, despite having talked about that multiple times. That happens sometimes in chess, guys. Sometimes you just have a blackout like that. If you saw my title Tuesday game with um, Igor Kovalenko from a few weeks ago, kind of a similar mental disconnect. I might be a hair better here. I still like my possibilities on the queen side. If we took all the rooks off the board, my king activity would definitely be a big factor. Getting the king up to c5, using my knight and my bishop to create threats. Okay, so white goes here. Maybe this knight is bound for b2. Obviously, it blocks white's rook play. Taking this pawn is way too dangerous. It allows stuff like knight takes e5 at minimum. So... I'm not really going to seriously consider that. I'd say rook c8, finally activating this rook, looks like the default thing to do here. Knight b2, maybe rook c3. So that is possible. Uh, knight b2, there's knight a4, though. Sneaky, sneaky. Maybe i got to throw the bishop in on b4 at some point. Rook c8, knight b2, bishop b3 might be the thing to do. Could play it right away, but now nah, I'm going to take the file first. Seize the file, but this is the rough plan. Knight b2, bishop b3, clamp a4, clamp c4. Attack the rook on d1. Okay. Now, if here, I did see that rook d7 is possible, but tactically I don't think it works because I take, take e7, take here, although my knight is hanging at the end. Mm, I have bishop takes b5. White's knight looks shaky. Okay. Under the time situation, I don't think I should bother spending too much time looking at that. Just play bishop b3. Yeah, I have other options, too, against rook d7. Uh, if I trade, for instance, my bishop even supports the knight from a distance. So I would bet that white moves this rook. Problem is where to put it. I mean, maybe b1. But I always have moves like a4. Also rook c3, perhaps. Okay, tense coming down to the wire here, guys. You blink and you're below five minutes. <laughs> yep, rook b1's played. Okay, rook c3, I think good chance white's gonna play king f2. I also really have to watch the a4 square. I mean, maybe white's going uh, bishop d1 in a lot of cases here. Kind of visually like a4 to solidify. I'm also thinking about this, honestly, and just pumping a rook into c1. Might be the best thing to do. Bishop d1. 
Rook C1. Some swaps possible. Should be a little bit better there. Let's go for that. Rook's not doing much on the e-file anyways. Ooh, wait a minute. Bishop d1. Okay. Yeah, there's no possibility of bishop takes b3 followed by taking my knight. That's important. I was just thinking if there was some line where if white was unpinned, they could do that, get two minors. But logistically, I don't think it's going to work. They'd have to play king f2 first. I take b1, they take b3. My knight is loose, but I should be able to nav navigate that. Okay, king f2. So rook c2 looks incredibly natural here. Is there any way a knight c4 type move messes me up though? Don't think so. Let's do it. Knight c4. I can play this rook captures. Let's pre move this capture. Okay, rook d7. This is held, remember. I did see this. I thought rook c7 at minimum, maybe even an a4 type move. Rook c7 might be a good move to play just to uh, release the pressure. I think white's going to go king e1 next move. Uh, maybe a4 is decent here. Uh, but then take... Now we're going to go rook c7. Yeah, let's play that. Take with the king or the rook. Let's take with the king. King e1, I'm thinking a4. Plays knight d3, okay. a4 or bishop c4. Bishop c4 presents some tactical problems. Time, time. Okay, let's go here. Ooh, that's a blunder, I think. I think we take now. Undefended rook. Yeah, well, I was trying to swap rooks down there, but they lost a piece. It's a pretty clean blunder, too, as in white doesn't get any compensation. Also pinned up here. Okay, and now this is a pedestrian win here. Can take this. Bishop's holding the pawn. All right, the opponent resigns. Thanks for the game to ABC. All right, yeah, this was not my best game, as I said. I think white played 
natural moves in the opening. Natural, but unspectacular. And I probably just didn't handle this accurately. I might have to go back and study these positions, this queenless middle game a little more because, yeah, I should have a better blueprint about what to do here. I was recalling ideas and playing more on feel than anything else, but it would be nice to know some, some concrete steps. I'd say the big thing in hindsight I wish I would have done different is develop the knight through d7 because I thought I was getting cute by doing this and maybe bothering them with b4 and thinking that this was actually a useful move to draw out of white. But in fact, the way the game played out, white's fully coordinated here. Yeah, I have the bishop pair, but you see I had to na navigate this knight d5, knight b5 stuff. That's a little hard to appreciate from several moves back, but I would prefer not to play this position again. And I think if white had appreciated this c5, knight d2, bishop c4 plan, I don't really have anything to work with that I see. c5 also blocks the dark square bishop, so it would just be a tough motif to, to deal with. So, yeah, I don't like that, how I handled that in the opening. And also, this was just a bad move. Bishop e7, inaccuracy. I spent all this time talking about how I want to avoid knight d5, and then I just did it. I think mentally, I assumed, maybe because I had been talking about it so much, that the white rook was going to d1, as I thought white was intending when they played rook d2. And there, knight d5 is not a problem. If you put the, the rook on d1 here, knight d5, take, take. There's no discovered check hitting my bishop. And I can move the bishop, and I also have d6 covered. So, yeah, kind of a mental blackout there. Yeah, and I, I do think I'm a little bit better here. I wouldn't be shocked if the engine just shows equality at this point, or maybe even after white plays b5, white's okay. But it, it does feel a little bit better for black, because I think the battle is taking place largely on the queen side and kind of in the center. And again, I think the king position does matter a lot in those situations. I think up through the very end, I played bishop c4. If white had played something like, let's say, king e1 here, well, I probably am better. I can take and go after this pawn. But there's like random b6 moves white can throw in. It's definitely not over here yet. There's also knight c1 maybe in this position if white wants to play a passive move. Again, I'd much prefer black. I feel like I'm going to win one of these pawns at some point, but white's in the game. But rook c1, this is a removal of the defender with the rook guarded on c2. So before I click over, as you know, uh, what I advocate and what a lot of strong players advocate in looking at your games is to try to draw some conclusions before you click on that analysis, right? We're not consulting the engine first. I haven't even looked at the engine yet. Haven't even run the auto analysis yet although it might already be run by a spectator or something, but you need to actively en engage your chess brain and think about what you're doing before you click that on. So yeah, I'm gonna target the opening for a couple, couple things here just to see how I could have played this stage better, maybe the knight a6 move. Uh, we'll look at the opening database. Also, I really wanna see what it says about like this position around here how much my advantage dips after bishop e7, and also the resulting play. So let's take a look. All right, so someone already did run the auto analysis. And okay, I actually got a pretty clean bill of health here. You guys can't see this, maybe I can move myself. Uh, it's a little cut off, but that's an 18 average centi pawn loss. Four inaccuracies, zero mistakes, zero blunders. Opponent, three inaccuracies, one mistake, one blunder. Uh, nice, nice looking graph here for me. Yeah, white was never significantly better. Uh, maybe up to a half pawn around the time I played a5. That'll be interesting to look at. So, okay. Let's see a couple things here. Maybe I can move me back. Ah, I'm gonna leave that alone for now. Okay, I think I actually just messed up my screen capture a little bit. I'm still getting used to OBS, so I apologize for that, guys. Um, D6, yeah, as I said, this is like 
align this queenless middle game that black is doing generally fine in and why when i face d6 as white i often play knight f3 just to stop black from playing e5 so this all happened trade of queens let's put up the database right around here see what we can find yeah you can see the stats here f6 black scoring incredibly well <laughs> This is known to be a, a good end game for black, or at least equal. E3. All right. So a lot of moves played here. I'm looking at the Masters database, by the way. Here, knight d7 is played most often. A5, king c7. Okay. So all moves on the queen side, really. Now knight h6. Okay, this is basically the game. Now bishop d2. The game with the knight coming to d7, that is. So, yeah, I think I should have played the knight to that square. That looks clear from having looked at this. Yeah. What about right here? When I played knight a6, engine's, engine likes knight f7 or knight d7. And when I play this, sorry for the fan noise, guys. That always happens when I load up Stockfish. <laughs> yeah, a3. So that's not like a huge difference, but it's about half a pawn. It does think a3, knight c5, b4, white's doing all right. Yeah, white just gets coordinate, coordinated pretty fast here. And the main tactical thing I was negotiating here was this rook d8 move. That's the move I wanted to play. But look at this, knight b5. Not even knight d5, because knight d5, I don't have to do this and allow the check and the attack on the bishop. I'd be stepping back with my king there. Uh, knight b5, just a nasty shot. Take, take. And I'm at white's mercy down the c-file here. I'd have to block with a bishop to save my rook on d8. And if I go king b8, I lose the rook. King c8, white can even take on a7 check. Probably their knight does not get trapped because it can come back out to b5. So that was sort of the, the crux of the tactical issue I was grappling with there. But yeah, white played this rook d2 move, which I think really did me a favor. You can see the auto analysis does not like that move. So, rook d2, no good for white. Yeah, and bishop e7, sure enough, that is a mistake. Better to play rook d8. I can finally put the rook on d8 if I want. What else is I thinking of here? I don't know. Yeah, I just didn't come up with a good move at this point. I even thought for a little while here. From 816 down to 739. But yeah, this was... Negating my bishop pair advantage. Now the position is roughly equal, it seems. White doubled. Okay, I went ahead and played a5. Computer's not a fan of that. Ah, it says white can play knight d3 here, really. Even though this is hanging. What happens here? Knight c5? Knight c5? Ah, and there must be a rook d7 operation that's going to give me problems. The bishop is hit, and a rook coming into d7 could be nasty. Check. Okay. That's an interesting line. Take. White's still temporarily down a pawn, but white's knight and rook look very good here. Dominating the 7th rank. Attacking b7. Yeah, okay. But fortunately on a5, white played b5, taking, and king b6 is correct. Rook c8 is correct. Looks like I played this stage of the game pretty well, according to the engine. All right. Yeah, that bishop on b3 stopping knight c4, knight a4. So crucial. Yep, likes rook c2. Likes rook 8 to c7. Yeah, just taking away this active piece. Okay, yeah. Position's just difficult here. This is already up to minus 3. It does seem like white drifted right around here when they played b5. And this is hard to appreciate. I wouldn't expect many people to play knight d3 and see that this pawn sack is good. But this is probably the stage of the game where white would have to look at as far as where they could improve. 
because uh, it seems to me they started to drift right there. And I would really question some of those earlier moves, like Rook D2 in particular. Yeah, and by the time we get here, it might already be winning for black. And this is a pretty strong valuation. That usually means winning. If B6, I'd probably play King C6. That's what I was intending in the game. Stay close to the pawn. It's trouble. It does say knight c1 might be the best move. And no rush, apparently. I can play a4. If he gets out of the pin, knight d6. Yeah, black is just much better placed for the resulting endgame. I was showing that line earlier where white could maybe get their rook to the 7th rank with the, with the knight on c5 attacking the pawns. And here it's kind of the opposite of that. Black is dominating pressure on the 2nd rank. Weak pawns here and here. Yeah, and rook c1, you saw what happens. Easy win from here. Okay. So, yeah, that got interesting later on. And I'm going to do a little bit more work on this line. But yeah, I do think the knight should go to d7. Maybe I should have just taken care of the king position and developed that knight first before worrying about the timing of knight h6. And if you played this line, maybe you picked up a thing or two. Again, from White's point of view, I would not recommend allowing e5 this early, right on move 2. You can play moves like knight f3 and stop it, or you can even transpose to a peer, a, a peer, Peart's defense by playing e4 here, where usually the play will go like this, and black will play either e5 or g6. All right, so thanks again to ABC for the game. Hope you guys like this standard game. Let me know if you have any questions in the comments. And I'll be back again soon, guys. Enjoy your day. See you later. Bye.